everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me. Hallelujah. This is, this is part, Nathan and Lawrence, part two of the previous teaching. I'm not going to go through an introduction. I'm going to get right into it. And if you're lost uh, as I go forward from this point, it might be helpful to go back and to watch part one. And uh, so we're going to continue with part two and wrap this teaching up. So we're talking about family here. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about the family of man and the family of Israel. And we're talking about that family merging with the family of Elohim or redeemed Israel, spiritual Israel. It is spiritual because He's forming his nature in us to become his children that he wants to live with forever. At the same time, and you have to play two or three dimensional chess here in your mind. We are so limited in our understandings and so linear in our understandings, many of us, that we, we can't juggle two or three things at the same time. Uh, and I struggle too. So while a family is being formed, a physical family that then leads into a spiritual family, a marriage is occurring also. And we've made reference to that. So Israel became a nation Ra Yah raised her up and he married her. Yeshua, the Messiah, or in his pre-incarnate state, married her at Mount Sinai. Exodus, cha Exodus chapter 20, uh, 19 through 24 is the, the marriage covenant. Israel preparing herself to be the virgin bride of the pre-incarnate Yeshua. She washed, in chapter 19, she washed herself, she cleaned her clothes, she got herself all clean. And, and then she said, I do, once in chapter 19 and twice, I think, in chapter 22. And the Torah was her marriage covenant. And it was a conditional covenant in that, Yah said, if you do this, then I will do this. Abrahamic covenant was not that kind of, kind of covenant. It was Yah saying, I will do this for you, Abraham, no matter what. And that's also the covenant of salvation. By grace, you are saved. By faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, once, but, but then we're saved unto good works. Is it, that's Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, starting in like verse like 6, 7, 8, and in there. And the same thing with the Abrahamic covenant. Saved by grace through faith. And Paul makes this very clear in Revelation, in Romans chapter 4. Saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But now that you are saved, what's the proof of? of your salvation. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And that's what the Mosaic Covenant was. Children of Israel, I just redeemed you out of Egypt. I brought you out of that land. I set you free. I washed you. I redeemed you from your sins, from the grip of Satan or the wor and the world or Egypt and Pharaoh. And now, the and I baptized you in the Red Sea for the remission of sins. You got to get the leavening out of your life unleavened bread. Now I brought you to Mount Sinai. I gave you my Torah. And about 1,500 years later, he wrote that Torah in their hearts on the day of Pentecost. 
in Acts chapter 2, but that's another discussion. And then he married them at Mount Sinai, and he said, if you, I will do this, do this, and this, and this to you, if you will diligently hearken unto my voice. And he made all these promises, and you obey your marriage covenant, which is my Torah. Those are the conditions and the terms. If you don't, if you do this, you will be blessed. If you don't, here's the consequences. Well, you all know what happened. The bride became, eventually became a whore, a harlot, an adulterous woman, and eventually she married her foreign lovers. Both the Jews and the, and the uh, from Judah and the Northern Kingdom. He wrote, he divorced both of them. Make no mistake, and I have written on this, and I have proven it from Scripture, both of them. The Jews were broken off also because they went into captivity because of disobedience. And you will find that, again, I don't have time to go into that right now. It's not part of this teaching. It wasn't just the northern kingdom. It was both of them. I could turn to something in Malachi right now. I think it's chapter 3, but I'm not going to. It shows Judah was broken off also. And she was given a bill of divorce because she committed adultery and she went after her foreign lovers. Okay. Now, at the same time, we have an interesting conundrum. An interesting conundrum. A riddle that there is not an easy answer to. Because we see in, again, I don't have the time. We'd be here many more hours. I've written about this on my website, and I've made videos about this. But the prophets predict that Israel would go back to Elohim. Now, the problem is Israel split. Israel was one person there at Mount Sinai. And then when the kingdom was divided under the son of Solomon, King Rehoboam, the kingdom split. The northern kingdom defected from the southern kingdom. And she became a woman, if you will, with a split personality. Uh, I think it's Jeremiah talks about oh, uh, uh, Ahola and Aholaba or whatever. You know, like two different women. But really it's the same woman. It's still Israel, all 12 tribes. And in Hosea, I think it's Hosea again. I you Forgive me, I do not have time to go through these right now. But it talks about in her adulteries, Israel would she'd be hanging out in the world with her foreign lovers, and she's going to say, man, it was better when I was back here with Yah than being in the world and suffering and going through all of this. And she's going to come back. This was prophesied in the Tanakh. She would come back. Now, we jump ahead to the New Testament. And Yeshua has the parable of the wedding feast. I don't have time to explain the allegorical implications of that, the prophetic allegorical implications. But Paul mentions a little bit later that he he's talking to the church there that he's writing the letter to. I think it's in to Corinth. I've espoused you to one bride or one uh, to Yeshua, the bridegroom. Par Yeshua gives the parable of the virgins. And he talks, other of, others of his parables refer to a wedding feast coming up. And he's talking about, it's about him. And then we see in the book of Revelation, the bride has made herself ready in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the church has, a, the Christian church has a sense of these things. But they don't know exactly, they don't know the overall context so they just kind of throw these things out there. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be married to Yeshua. I'm going to be the bride. And we have a big party in heaven called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. They don't know how that relates to the Feast of Tabernacles or any of that. So the problem is, though, and this is where the conundrum is, is that 
The Torah has a, a law. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting in verse 1, and I will read this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before Jehovah. And you shall not bring sin on the land which Jehovah, your Elohim, is giving you as an inheritance. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. That means that Yah, Yeshua, cannot take back his adulterous wife. She can repent, she can desire her former husband, want to come back to Torah, but he cannot take her back as his wife. And yet, the prophets prophesy he's going to. And the New Testament talks about this. What is the solution to this dilemma? Before we answer that question, let's go to something else in the book of in the Torah, the book of Numbers, chapter eleven, starting in verse chapter five, starting in verse eleven. The ritual of the adulterous woman and Yeshua's death on the cross. So in Numbers chapter five, we deal with a very curious ritual involving wives suspected of adultery called the law of jealousies. What does this ancient and arcane ritual have to do with the modern disciples of Yeshua? On the surface, wouldn't appear to be, you know, much, we might say dismissively. But upon closer analysis, and you plug Yeshua into the picture, suddenly, there's a whole new perspective. Now, I've read what the Jewish sages have to say about this. And they, in their commentaries, and they don't understand it. But they do have some things that are rather interesting. For example, uh, according to the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, when this, so a woman suspected of adultery was hauled before the priests, her head was uncovered, and according to Jewish tradition, her dress was ripped open just above her breasts. And then she had the choice to drink a concoction. Now, this is in the Bible. This is in the Torah. She, was, she had to drink a concoction of earth from the floor of the tabernacle mixed with water from the bronze laver, holy water, into which was dipped a piece of paper that contained the curses written on it. The, you know, the, the, the penalty for adultery was death. If she was guilty of the charges of adultery when she drank the bitter waters, her belly would swell and her thighs or loins or the seat of procreative, procreative, procreative uh, power would not would rot as a result of divine judgment. There's no medical or physical explanation for this. This was simply divine judgment. If she was, was guiltless, on the other hand, the bitter waters would have no effect on her. If she refused to drink the bitter water and her husband still suspected her of unfaithfulness, then he was free to divorce her even though she had admitted no guilt. According to Jewish tradition, this legal procedure was carried out by the Israel's highest court in Jerusalem. So some Bible commentators see a parallel between the adulterous woman and the trial and execution of Yeshua at the cross. 
On the surface, this explanation may seem improbable, but as we go on, I think we'll see otherwise and much more besides. So let's disambiguate the meaning of this curious ritual and consider this, and consider it as to how this is prophetic of Yeshua dying uh, in the place of adulterous Israel. And then we'll see where we go with this. So we know that Yovah likened his relationship to Israel to a marriage in Ezekiel 16. And we also know that both the northern and southern kingdoms didn't remain faithful to her marriage covenant. And we see that again in Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 23, and Jeremiah 3, and the entire book of Hosea. Under the Torah, adultery was a capital offense, Leviticus 20, verse 10. Now, of course, Jehovah was faithful to his marriage covenants with Israel. He is not a sinner. He's not a, viol a violator of his own Torah. Remember what 1 John 1, 3 says, sin is a violation of the Torah, the law, the Torah law. With whom was the fault for the failure of the marriage? Blasphemously, sinfully, damnably, the many in the Christian church, many teachers who should know better, but who are false teachers, lay, and I say emphasize the word blasphemously, lay the guilt at the foot of Yehovah's perfect Torah law and by implication at the foot of Yehovah himself. And you have all heard that be said. Shame on them if they don't repent of their wickedness, they will come under judgment. Not my judgment, the judgment of the word of Elohim. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. We're talking about the Mosaic, not the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of salvation, but the Mosaic covenant. And then the second one would be the renewed or the new covenant. Because, verse 8, because finding fault with them, not with it, with them, with the people. He says, behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 and 33. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them or divorced them, says Jehovah. And I, um, but, let's see. For this is the covenant that I will make with them, still quoting Jeremiah, that with the house of Israel, after those days, says Jehovah, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, they shall be my people. And so forth. So the covenant was, the, the fault was with the Israelites. And I've used this example many times. If you buy a house and you have an agreement to pay the bank or whoever you're buying the house from so much each month or whatever the terms of the agreement are, and you fail to make the terms, the agreement to which you agreed, the covenant, whose fault is it? Is it the covenant or is it your fault for failing to make the payments and the house gets repossessed? the house, the car, whatever it happens to be. Well, of course, it's your fault. You didn't make the, you didn't live up to the terms of the agreement. And that's exactly what Israel failed to do. So why these false teachers can blame the law for the Israel's sin, again, is taking something holy, the covenant and the Torah, which is a reflection of the mind, the will, and the character of Elohim, and calling it evil, 
And that is the biblical definition of blasphemy. And if people persist in that, Yeshua made it very clear. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, if that's if some people cross that line, wherever that line might be, it's, I'm not the one to judge, then they will lose their salvation. So these are very serious issues. So the fault was with Israel. And ultimately, all of us have sinned and violated Yovah's Torah laws. We have fallen short of his glory, Romans 6.23. And the scriptures are clear that the penalty and the wage of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Ezekiel 18, verse 4. But I can hear people saying, oh, but I'm a Gentile Christian. I'm not an Israelite. I dodged that bullet. <laughs> not so quick. You didn't dodge any bullets. You are subsumed by your own ignorance. Dare I be so blunt? You gotta be very careful. You or, or subsumed by false teachings that you have heard and accepted without proving all things and comparing it with the scriptures have said. You might say, you know, I'm not a Gentile Christian, I'm not as as Israelite. Neither I nor my ancestors was ever an Israelite who was spiritually married to Yovah. Therefore, I'm not guilty of spiritual unfaithfulness. I have not broken any marriage covenants with Yovah. And so in response to this, to this protestation, I would ask the question, who did Yeshua come to redeem? He says in Matthew 15, 24, he came to redeem the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Have you been redeemed by Yeshua or saved? Then he defines you as being part of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For scripture likens all wayward sinners to the lost sheep who have gone astray. What do we read here in the famous passage, the Messianic passage in Isaiah 53 that we use to prove that Yeshua died on the cross for our sins? Verse 6, By his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Yovah has laid on him, Yeshua, the iniquity of us all. So yeah, we are like lost sheep. Moreover, Paul equated, and this is a very important point. Paul, Paul was, a, was a legal genius and a Torah expert. He probably forgot more about the Torah than many of us Paul put together, I'm guessing. He probably had it memorized, the entire Torah. Moreover, Paul equated Gentile believers with the house of Israel in Romans 9, verse 25 through 29. This is a very important point. I mean, this is exactly what Paul says. Let's go here real quickly. Romans 9, 25. Romans 9, 25. Come on, Romans, where are you? There you are. Nope. I keep going back and forth between Acts and 1 Corinthians. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Romans 9, 25 through, 20, through 20, uh, 9, 25 through 29. He says here, and he's quoting Hosea, referring to the believers in Rome. I, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not be, uh, beloved. And it shall come to pass in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. And then he quotes Isaiah in verse 27. Isaiah who cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel were, uh, would be the sand of the sea, the, rem the remnant shall be saved for he will finish the work and cut in short in righteousness because Jehovah will make a short work upon the earth. 
and verse 29. Uh, as, I say, as, I, as Isaiah said before, unless the Yovah uh, of Sabaoth had left them us a seed, we would have all become like Sodom and we would all been like Gomorrah. And then he goes on and he talks about the Gentiles. The whole context here is Israel, but also the Gentiles are included in this. And I don't have time to go into all the details. I've done whole teachings on this. But you have to remember, yes, there were Jews in Rome, but there were also a lot of Gentiles in the church in Rome. Like all the churches were mixtures of both Jews and non-Jewish people. <clears throat> Again, I'd like to spend more time uh, explaining this, but um, I can't at this time. Otherwise, we'd be here the rest of the day. And let's take a look further at F. Um, Jacob when he's on his deathbed back in uh, Genesis chapter 48. Because here he states prophetically who the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh would be. And Ephraim was um, eventually became a label, even though it was one tribe, but it eventually became a label for the northern house or northern kingdom of Israel that included the 10 northern tribes. It says here in Genesis 8, 48, verse 14 through 16. Then Israel, or Jacob, stretched, remember, he's on his deathbed and he's praying prophetically over his sons. His, uh, that is Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Then Israel stretched out his hands and his right hand on the head of Ephraim's head. And uh, I'm sorry, then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, who was the older. So normally you would go it like this, but he crossed his hands and he made the younger the, the, the main inheritor of the blessing for whatever reason. And he made the sign of the cross and the sign of the fish, which was one of the earliest symbols of Christianity because Yeshua told his disciples to go out and become fishers of men. Then Jacob says, verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, God or Elohim before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac walked, the, the Elohim who has fed me all my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me. In my Bible, angel is capitalized because the Bible translators realize this is referring to Yeshua, the Messiah. He is not an angel in the stereotypical sense as we think of an angel because the word in Hebrew, malak, for angel is means a messenger. Yeshua was a divine messenger. He was the part of the Godhead. He was the son of Elohim, the father, and he was the messenger to the earth, to humanity. He's the one that spoke to and appeared before the patriarchs and Moses, the burning bush, and was in the fire that led the Israelites to the wilderness. So the word angel here would be better if it were divine messenger. This is the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Who has redeemed us from all evil? The Bible reveals it's Yeshua, the Messiah. Who is it on the face of this earth, among the peoples of this earth, who talk about the Redeemer or Savior? who saves them from evil, from sin. I'll tell you who it's not. It's not the Jews. It's definitely not the Buddhists. 
or the Muslims or the Hindus or the witches or the Satanists or the, the natives of the native religions, the animists and whatever, or any other religion that you want to name. It's only the Christians. This is where he is, Jacob is predicting who the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh would be. And then he goes on to say, The angel who has redeemed me, who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be upon them and the name of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the sea. The word multitude is the Hebrew word daga. And if you go read some of the Jewish translations, like in the Art Scroll, I believe it's the Art Scroll, the Orthodox Jewish translation, it says, let them become a multitude like fish or a multitude in the, like fish in the midst of the seas. So there's the fish thing again. In the seas of humanity scattered throughout the world. I have talked, I'm just giving you the most bare um, understanding of this. I have written a lot about this in other things. I'm just skimming over the waves. How Christians, in a really loose sense, are the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, or the northern tribes. Whether they are biological or whether they are grafted in, it doesn't matter. And they come in alongside the Jews. And the two sticks of Ezekiel 37 will be brought one, brought, brought into one through Messiah. We could talk a lot about all of this. But he's going to bring everything back together again. Humpty Dumpty put back together again. Now, Paul clearly states that in all, that all those who have put their trusting faith in Yeshua the Messiah are descendants of Abraham. Here's another witness. Here's another proof of what I'm saying. All of us. Romans 4.16 I'm giving you multiple witnesses here. This is not all that could be given. I'm giving you some of the highlights. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to the grace so that the promise might be sure to all seed and not only to those who are of the law, the Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And he's talking again to the Romans. There would be no doubt people of Jewish um, descent in that congregation, but there were many Gentiles as well. Let's go over to Romans chapter 9, verse 8. That that is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of Elohim, the children of God. He's saying those who are biological Jews are not the children of Elohim. They are the children of Abraham, but not the children of Elohim. That these, that those who are the children of the, of the flesh not of the spirit, but of the flesh, are not the children of, El of, of Elohim, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise at this time. I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having uh, done any good or evil, that the purpose of Elohim, according to the election, might not stand, 
not of works lest, uh, but of him who calls. So he's saying here, again, that the people of the flesh, who are born of the flesh, even if they're Jewish or whatever tribe, that doesn't mean that they're not, they're not the children of Elohim. They are the children of the patriarchs, but not the glorified or potentially glorified sons of Elohim, unless they do something. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Galatians 3, verse 7. Galatians 3, verse 7. Galatians 3 is loaded with a lot of these. Verse 7. Now he's writing to the believers, to the saints in Galatia. They're in Asia Minor. Again, there probably were Jews in the congregation, but there were also non-Jews. Many, probably the majority, were people of the nations or Gentiles. Therefore know, verse 7, Genesis or Galatians 3, 7, Therefore know that only those who are of faith, who are of faith. What is of faith? Faith in Elohim. Faith in Yeshua. That's what Paul's talking about here. Therefore know that only those who are faith are of faith are of faith are sons of Abraham. Verse 9. Well, let me just read verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that Elohim would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In all nations shall be blessed. In you all nations shall be blessed. So it wasn't just Judah or the, the Jews of the tribe of Judah, or even of the, the other 11 tribes, but all the nations. And then we go down here and read verse 28, again, still in Galatians chapter 3. Well, verse 26, For you are all sons of Elohim through faith in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you as were baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's sperm. That's what the word seed there means. Sperm and heirs according to the promise. The word there for seed is sperma, where we get sperm. You are literal descendants of Abraham. You may not have be biological descendants in the, in the human sense. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But that's not how you become a son of Elohim. It's through Messiah, Yeshua, and through the impregnation of the spirit into your spirit and the work of Yah, a spiritual work in you, that you can be adopted into the family of Elohim. So, we were talking about the ritual of the uh, adulterous woman, and I wanted to address the question or the concern or the rebuttal that, well, I'm not part of Israel, so this does not apply to me. Let me give you one other place if you're still questioning. <laughs> which you, those of you still listening, probably you're in agreement or at least open. The rest probably already turned this off a while back. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. This is Paul, again, writing to the church, to Christians and or to Jews and mostly non-Jews. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, so past tense, you used to be Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the circumcision. That is, you were called uncircumcised by the Jews. That at that time, verse 12, you were without Messiah, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were not citizens members of the nation of Israel. You were outside that. You were, you were something else. You were, you know, of the heathen nations. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise without hope and without God in this world. I don't know about you, but I'm not a Gentile. I might have used to be one, 
but I ain't one anymore. Why? But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. The terms far off and brought near are terms right out of Hosea and other places in the Bible referring to the lost and scattered sheep of Israel. These are code words. Go look it up. I've written about that. I've done the homework. It's all there. They're code words for those who know their scriptures and their prophecies referring to lost and scattered Israel and all the people they intermarried with coming back and being regathered, what the Jews call the final redemption. For he himself, verse 14, is our peace and who has made both one and has brought down the middle wall of separation. That was the wall in the temple that kept the Gentiles out of going into the temple. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments containing ordinances, so as to create one new man. We'll come back to that verse in a minute. One new man from two, thus making himself that he might reconcile both, both the Jews and the Gentiles or the non-Jews, to Elohim in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. The enmity was the sin and the penalty and the enmity between the two houses, between the Jews and the Gentiles. And there's, that has existed for a long time. We just think of the Catholic Church and the Inquisition. And the Christians, the Jews persecuted the Christians early on too. For through him, okay, so, and he came, verse 17, and preached peace to those who were afar off. There's that, there's that buzzword again, talking about the house of Israel that was far off, that went into captivity. He's going to bring back near. And, and to those who are near, near and far off. For through him, we both has, have access by one spirit. We both. Both Jews and Gentiles, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, both the descendants, descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh, as well as the tribe of Judah, we both have access by one spirit to the Father through Yeshua the Messiah. And then verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. There's another phrase referring to the two houses of Israel. You can look up the terms foreigners and strangers, and the prophets use those terms in reference to lost and scattered Israel. You are no longer strangers and, uh, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of Elohim. Yes, that is a very beautiful picture of the truth of who we are. How Yah views us how scripture views us, and I mean, what more can be said? Most, most people affirm the fact that they're Gentiles because of a rebellious attitude toward obedience to the Torah. Let's just take the lid off that garbage can and look at and see below the rebellious, sinful heart of man that is enmity against the laws of Elohim is not subject to it neither indeed can be now that we've established that all believers in Yeshua are, are our offspring whether biological or grafted in to the descendants of Jacob and thus Israelites let's ask the next question at the cross we know that Yeshua bore himself upon himself all of our sins we just read that in Isaiah 53 did he also bear upon himself our guilt for kidimating spiritual adultery when in our ignorance we disobeyed the commandments of Elohim when we sinned by serving and worshiping and obeying other gods like the self, money, pleasure, sex, education, power, approval of others, drugs, and so on. Remember, we're answering the question, how could Yeshua remarry a bride that he divorced, and yet the prophets say he's going to remarry. And the apostles say that. And Yeshua talks about being a bridegroom, and he talks about virgin brides and 
you know, many of his parables. How is this is the conundrum that we're we're talking about, and we brought in the ritual of the adulterous woman, and I've taken you in various places. Now we're going to tie it all together. Hopefully this will make sense. Well, indeed, Yeshua died in our place. We all know this by taking on our sins. But we, because we are lost and scattered Israel, we were like that adulterous woman. In our ignorance, in our scattered state, before we got saved, we worshiped false gods. We sinned, and we've probably sinned, doubtlessly, since we got saved. He died in our place by taking on the punishment of the adulterous woman. Remember, adultery under the Torah, the penalty is death. Moreover, Scripture tells us that his trial and crucifixion were like his drinking a bitter cup, just like the woman when she drank the cup of the water from the bronze laver mixed with dirt from the floor of the tabernacle with the words of her of the law and her sin written on the paper that was dissolved in there. And she had to drink that. So Yeshua drank, his suffering was like drinking a bitter cup. Matthew 26, 39, verse 42, John and John 18, 11. Furthermore, Yeshua was hauled before the highest religious court in the land of Israel in Jerusalem to stand trial to his death. Matthew 26, 57 through 68. Like the adulterous woman on trial in, number, in, on, on trial in Numbers chapter 5, he was stripped of his garments. Matthew 27, 31. And while on the cross, his side was ripped open by the Roman soldier's spear. John 19, verse 34. Just like the woman, if she was guilty of adultery, her guts would rot out. They would, they would, whatever. As a substitution, substitution for us, he took the curses that were against us for our spiritual adultery in times past that would have been written on a piece of paper, Numbers 5.23. Again, the adulterous woman ritual. With this in mind, Paul addresses this very thing in Colossians 2, 12-15, with special emphasis on verse 14, where he states that Yeshua took the curses or penalties for our, our violating Yovah's laws that were against us and paid the sin, debt, or penalty in full for each of us when he died on the cross. Many of you have had people quote Colossians 2.15. Well, <laughs> now you know the rest of the story and you know the backstory what Paul had in his mind when he wrote this. It says here, having wiped out you being dead in your, verse 13, dead in your trespasses and, un, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having given you all, ha, having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, that mostly likely that could be referring to what was written uh, on that piece of paper for the adulterous woman. It could also refer to the, the book that says the books will be opened at the white throne judgment and all the deeds of human beings that have been written in, you know, they've done will be written in these books. But of course, if you're under the blood of Yeshua and you receive forgiveness, they will be erased and that will not be held against you. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He didn't nail the Torah to the cross. He nailed our sins and um, the accusations that were against us because of a record of our bad deeds. That's what he nailed to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over it. What does he mean by that? Heaven is a courtroom. There's a throne, and Elohim is our just judge. And there's a court, the court of heaven is called the sons of Elohim, or the hosts of heaven. And we see in the book of Job, from time to time, Elohim, the father, calls people in 
or calls people, not people, but calls, like we see Satan, he called the sons of Elohim in. In this case, Satan came and he made an accusation against Job there before the courts of heaven. That's in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. And he, you know, Yah asked him, have you, you know, is there anybody so righteous as Job? And, of course, Satan has an accusation. It's a false accusation. And you know the story. And we also see in Romans, Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And he's accusing the brethren day and night before the throne of Elohim, day and night. And it says that they overcame him, the saints, by the blood of the Lamb. When you are under the blood of the Lamb and you have repented of your sins and gotten under the blood of the Lamb, Lamb, that means Yeshua has paid for your sins and Satan can no longer use your sins against you. That's the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. And that's making a public spectacle of Satan. When Satan comes and says, well, you know, didn't Nathan do this and this? And Yeshua, who's at the right hand of Elohim as our defense attorney, as our advocate, is saying, no, he's under my blood. I have a covenant with him. He has repented. You cannot falsely accuse him of that. Get behind me, Satan. And Yeshua makes a mocking or a mockery and a spectacle of him there at the courts of heaven. All right. Yes, few Christians understand this glorious truth, how we are all like the adulterous woman, woman and how Yeshua took upon himself the charges that were laid against us because of our sins. And then he paid the penalty in full for them when he died on the cross. The scriptures predicted his horrific yet glorious um, event of the crucifixion in the time of Moses down to the smallest detail some 1,500 years before the crucifixion occurred. Give Elohim the glory. Now, in conclusion, we want to go to one other place, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. And now we're going to tie some other loose ends together. I'm looking around the room because I've got people here. Um, and I've, been, I've been ignoring the guys on Zoom. You're over there listening. But I've got some people on Zoom that are also in this room. And I'm looking at my wife. She's over there. Hi, Sandy. And she's right now, she's... Uh, She's listening to me, but she's munching on a cracker and a piece of cheese. And then I've got uh, Wendy over here sitting on the couch. She's looking, she waves. She's looking out at the ocean, which is kind of foggy right now. You can't really see the waves too well. And I got the boys up in the loft there, sitting there with their legs crossed and their Bibles across their, their uh, laps. And, uh, you know, this is, like, this is like our little family gathered here. I'm so blessed. So I'm walk. I'm, I'm, I'm looking around. So that's why I'm looking around because I'm, you know, as a public speaker, I like to make eye contact from time to time with the people I'm talking to. So forgive me, those of you on the on the camera that are watching on Zoom. Um, we've got a little audience here, both digitally, electronically, as well as uh, in person. So it's kind of exciting. And as you see, too, my face is getting darker and darker because right now it's about three o'clock on the West Coast. So the sun is moving around. It was over here to my right. And now it's moving around and it's heading over over the ocean and here in several hours it will set so the sun now is coming in through this window and i probably could shut the window and and it wouldn't be quite so bright and i'm now the shadows aren't quite so so um so harsh on my face not that that makes that much difference it's the word that not the face that matters and i'm hoping this word is inspiring you and helping you to understand some of the greater aspects of Yehovah's plan of salvation. Oh, you know, when I learned some of these truths myself over the years, some of them many years ago, it brought the whole Bible alive. And I realized that as glorious as the, the gospel messages, messages that our brothers and sisters in the Christian church teach and have been teaching 
for the better part of you know 1900 years there's so much more and the message i'm giving you does not in any way invalidate the basic gospel message that the church has been teaching other than they say that the, to the law has been done away with but the basic gospel message who yeshua is his death on the cross salvation by grace through faith and paying the price for our sins it nothing here is contradicting that it's just building a huge beautiful structure like a glorious building on a solid foundation that's been there all along and now it's i get excited about that now it's time to grow and build on that foundation and get excited and get passionate for yeshua and the word of elohim this these truths have been in here all along hidden in plain sight and they've been kept back from many many people and now he's bringing this these truths out here in these last days preparing his bride to be more in love with yeshua than ever before and i'm hoping that this that this these truths inspire you and want you to dig in and worship and obey and serve and seek and follow after yeshua the both the living word and the written word with with more passion and zeal than ever before that's my desire it certainly has helped me in my walk okay let's go to romans in conclusion let's go to romans chapter one a uh, chapter seven one through six and i'm going to read the whole passage here and you probably will know how you have heard this this uh, these six verses interpreted in your past churches and how they have been interpreted by preachers so let me read it without comment or do you or and i'm quoting or do you not know brethren for i speak to those who know the law that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives but if the husband dies she is released from the law of her husband so when then if while her husband lives she marries another man she will be called an adulteress but if her husband dies she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man therefore my brethren you also have become dead to the law through the body of the messiah that you may be married to another to him who has raised who has raised from the dead that we should not that we should bear fruit to elohim for when we were in the flesh the sinful passions which we were aroused which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. End quote. How many of you have heard this passage say, we're dead to the law, like all of Yah's commandments, so now we don't have to do it anymore? I don't have to keep the Sabbath. I don't have to, you know, follow the biblical dietary laws. I don't have to do all those burdensome feasts. I can go out eating pork, bat, squid, sea cucumber. I'm here by the sea where all these restaurants have all this stuff. You know, octopus, slugs, snails, if you're French. pickled pig's feet, scorpions, rattlesnake, if you live in Texas or someplace like that, whatever they eat, armadillo, squirrels. Oh, while we're at it, not doing the law, I guess it's all right. I'm going to go have sex with your wife. How do you like that one? The law has been done away with. I'm going to go out and have sex with your daughter. I'm going to go out and, and steal your car or your house. I mean, we're, we're free from the law. Oh, 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 but the law's, so the law's been done away with. Oh, yeah, but if you're in the Christian church, one law that has not been done away with is the law of the big T, 
The big T. We wouldn't want to defund the church now, would we? We wouldn't want the pastor to have to go out and get a real job, would we? I'm being a little bit sarcastic. The big T, the law of tithing. Oh, oh, that law will keep because it suits us just fine. Got to keep us fat and happy. And I hate to say, but mo most pastors have a big fat gut on them. That would be good for them to go out and dig some ditches and do some physical labor. No, they do. Not all, but many. You've seen them all. I, I speak plain. My wife's going, ah, don't say that. No, it's true. She's over there looking at me. <laughs> She's the, you know, she knows that she, she doesn't talk that way. I do. We've got to get people's attention. Okay, so we just read this. It's Romans 7, 1 through 6. What is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about a law that pertains to a husband and a wife. In fact, if you read and about marriage and divorce, in fact, if you read in the King James, I've got the New King James Bible here. But if you read in, um, we see in verse um, 2, the law of her husband. What is, this, what is this law of her husband? And then in verse, uh, my, new, my new King James says, that law in verse 3. If her husband dies, she is free from that law. What law? These words here, they're the Greek word tau. Uh, um, it looks like T-O-U. And it means, it can mean the, but it's a weak demonstrative pronoun, which it can also mean this or that. That's why referring to a specific law. Now, I've written all of this. I've looked at the lexicons. I've worked, looked at the leading Greek experts. I also took a year of biblical Greek at the academic level, so I have a little bit of knowledge of this, but I've also backed that up with, with uh, the, the leading um, lexicons and Greek linguists and experts um, in our time. You could translate this by saying, this law of her husband, or this or that law, or if you go down to verse 5, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by that law. It's all the Greek word tau. But now we have been delivered from that law. What law? That's the law we read about in, uh, in back in this, uh, De uh, Deuteronomy 24. It says, if your wife commits adultery, leaves you, or you write her a bill of divorcement because of her unfaithfulness, and she goes and marries another man, she cannot come back and remarry you, even if her second husband dies. That's the law that prohibits Yeshua, like I said before, from marrying his Israel, even though the even even though the Bible says it's going to happen. Remarrying, I should say, Israel, which is what the renewed covenant or the new covenant really is, is a marriage covenant. That's a whole other discussion. All of these balls, like juggling multiple balls or pulling, playing chess at multiple levels, this is the mind of Elohim. We have a family, we have a marriage, we have the Torah, we have the steps in the biblical wedding, we have the tabernacle of Moses, we have the biblical feast. All of these things are all interrelated, are all part of the plan of salvation to lead us to becoming the glorified sons and daughters of Elohim. And that's why it'll all come together through Messiah Yeshua and the two will become one, Gentile and Israelite, Jew and Gentile. The two families become one. The heavenly family and the earthly family. The covenants all merge together. There's a marriage. It all comes together in Yeshua and culminates, at, or let's say, 
begins to culminate at his second coming into the millennium, the marriage feast of the Lamb, and eventually, which is through the millennium, and eventually then in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, where they live happily ever after as one flesh, husband and wife, like a family. So, we're leaving one unanswered question. How is it that Yeshua, we've kind of answered it, but let me zero in, that Yeshua can remarry Israel? Well, and not violate this Torah law in Deuteronomy 24. Yeshua died, or Yeshua married Israel in his pre incarnate state at Mount Sinai. She went astray, committed adultery, became a, a, um, an adulterous woman. She wants to come back, remarry him. And that's Malachi talking about coming back, you know, the hearts of the fathers turning back to the children, the children of their fathers, and, and there are other places too. It's about the message of John the Baptist preparing the bride for the bridegroom. The message of John the Baptist and Elijah. Oh, there's so many things we could bring into this whole picture. But, and this is Paul saying, I'm espousing you, the church, the potential bride to be the bride of Yeshua. Yeshua. And we read about it in the book of Revelation. We've already read these. The bride is making herself ready by putting on the garments, white linen garments of the righteous deeds of the saints. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So Yeshua, her his wife divorced him went after another man he could not take her back so what did he die do he came to this earth and died in her place resurrected as a new different person if you will in a different form he was glor totally glorified he put his god his, his glory off to the side when he came to the earth, became the God-man, then resurrected and glorified and with a glorified, resurrected body. He took upon her himself all of her penalties, her sins, and died in her place. That's the basic message of redemption. At the same time, that adulterous woman, which we all have been, when we came to faith in Yeshua the Messiah, we went through baptism, the first ritual that we're commanded to go through, baptism for the remission of sins, and we died to the old man, and we became a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a new creation in Messiah that's ultimately going to become a glorified son and daughter of Elohim. That is who Yeshua, the new God-man, if you will, is going to marry the new glorified, resurrected Israelite, redeemed Israelite bride. So his bride is a new creation, and he is a different entity, and he died to pay for her price, of her sins, which is why we now can go and marry him as his bride. <coughs> and we are a new creation without violating the Torah law. That's what being born again, being begotten is all about. That is the two becoming one. That is the ultimate union between Christ, Messiah, and his church, the bride, which is likened to the body of Yeshua. And that's how that dilemma is rectified. And that's how the family of Elohim started out with Adam and Eve 
was birthed and came up through the patriarchs, became like a bride, married, went astray, came back, and is remarrying Yeshua through the new covenant as the redeemed Israelite, not a redeemed Gentile. Well, you may have started out as, the, as a Gentile, but no longer anymore. And now you are the bride of Yeshua. As we've said many times, there is no Gentile gate in the New Jerusalem. There's the gates in the New Jerusalem are named by the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 12. Now, when Yeshua comes back, this process, oh, and remember, uh, Yeshua told his disciples to go out into, you know, he raised them up as fishers of men, verses uh, 4, Matthew 4, 19. And then he said, you shall uh, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Acts 1, 8, his last words before he sent it to heaven. And in Matthew 10, verse 6, he said, but go rather, you know, to the lost sheep. He said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he said in Matthew 15, but he's, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this is who he has come to redeem. And this is how he sent his disciples out as fishers of men to fish for the fish in the sea and bring them to the cross of Messiah. He said, if I be lifted up, he told Nicodemus, I will draw all men unto myself. And then he said, Yeshua commissioned the church to make disciples in Matthew 28, 19, or spiritual children who will become the glorified sons and daughters of Elohim. This process of regathering and redeeming lost and scattered Israel is actually the merging of the two families, a physical family into a spiritual family that will populate the kingdom of Elohim for eternity. It is also the merging of the nation of nations of the world into one nation, the nation of Israel. This is the essence of the gospel message. And this is a real message of inclusivity. The world's message of inclusivity is a false and demonic one that eventually will destroy the human race. And the devil who comes to kill, steal, and destroy is behind that message because he does not want to see the family or kingdom of Elohim expanded. Satan is currently trying to create his own family or kingdom as a subversive counterfeit to the one that Elohim has been creating since the beginning of time. The Bible refers to this false kingdom as the spirit of Antichrist or mystery Babylon, the great, and likens it to a sexually deviant whore that has engulfed all the nations of the world into her, her alluring and voluptuous embrace and intoxicated them with the wine of her fornication. You see the sexual theme throughout Scripture. This is in Revelation chapter 13 and 18 and 19, or 17 and 18. And it is, it is this... Um, this um, um, uh, th this is this is the this this Babylon the Great is what the um, globalists globalist elites or I like to refer to them as scumbags who are pr promoting their new world order are all sexual perverts and deviants of all sorts and they promote fornication uh, abortion people living together outside of marriage homosexual marriages, pedophilia, drug and alcohol addictions, pornography, um, uh, transhumanism, uh, transgenderism, and genetic modification, all other sorts of, 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 um, of evil. They're all sexual perverts. Make no mistake about it. And this is what Satan offers the world. But the physical family, as Yovah originally created, is a glorious precursor and first step toward 
the ultimate reality of an immortalized and glorified family of Elohim, and Satan is doing everything to subvert and then to destroy the family. This is why the spirit of Antichrist, which is rapidly rampant across the earth to this day, is so vehemently opposed to the family and is attempting to kill, steal, and destroy everything that pertains to the male and female marriage and family. Murder the family and the cornerstone foundation and building block of society and the kingdom of Elohim is destroyed. That is why the light of Yehovah's truth must shine on this subject and reveal to the people the creator's ultimate and sublime and divinely revealed truth behind male and female, marriage, sexual procreation, and how this all leads to expanding the family and the kingdom of Elohim. And the Feast of Tabernacles today, which we are uh, wrapping up, is the first universal expression, or will be the millennium, the first universal expression of that kingdom of heaven on earth. When Satan will be in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and the glorified sons and daughters of Elohim who were resurrected with Yeshua at his second coming will be kings and priests, or the glorified bride of Yeshua, and they will be teaching the world, teaching the world the wonderful truth of the message of the gospel and the Torah, to worship and to love Yeshua the Messiah. And that is the fuller, more expanded version of the gospel message which you have all heard. And I hope and pray this, this has inspired you and this has been a blessing to you. And there's probably more that we have to learn, but that's what I know and understand up to this point. And may Yah bless us all and bring us closer to Him. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good.